Thank you for coming to my place and welcome. It's great to have you all here. And it's great to have you here on a good day where the wind's not blowing like crazy here and it's not raining, so it's a good day for it. So, uh, yeah, my topic is growing arrow is in the subtropics. And uh, as I always say at the beginning of, beginning of a talk, if you are happy with the way your plants are growing, don't change anything based on what I say. Do your own research. Um, the thing is, we all have a unique environment. My environment here is considerably different to my colleagues and friends who live over on the coast, where it's quite a bit, bit warmer in winter and not as hot as it gets out here in summer. So we have a, you know, a, a slightly different environment here to people who only live, say, 30 k's from here. We had frost here this year for the first time since I've been here, which is um, more than 20 years. Uh, so we, I am in a bit of a cold zone in winter and I have to bear that in mind um, with the growing of my plants. Before I get into the actual cultivation though, I'd like to just go through a little bit of history. Carl Linnaeus listed arrowies in his species plantarium in 1753. He didn't list many, but he listed some arrowies back then. But then it was, it was nearly a hundred years before another botanist picked up the baton and started doing research and classification of aroids. And it was an a, 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 um, Austrian botanist by the name of Heinrich Scott who in uh, 1858 published a document called Genera Aroidianum. He listed 900 species and put them into 12 tribes. He set the he set the framework for all future classifications of aroids because this man not only looked at herbarium specimens the way Linnaeus had, he went into field and, and looked at the plants in the wild and he also studied live plants um, as they grew in his glasshouses. And that's how he was able to do this incredible classification. So we say... His was the framework for all subsequent, subsequent classifications. But every single level has changed. Everything he did has changed except for one genus. And that's the genus Calla. It's still where he put it in the 1850s. Every other species and genus has been moved somewhere else. So the botanists back then had actually got hold of as I said, 900 plants, different plants, and been able to study them. But there were very, very few plants in cultivation. They weren't in people's gardens, they weren't in people's ferneries. They weren't in cultivation except for the really obscure collectors who went and found these things. So at the cultivation level, not much happened for a long time. It wasn't until the 1900s, um, beginning of the 20th century, that they were introduced into cultivation in the West, especially the good ones from Central and South America. So I have a book called uh, Tropical Gardening, written by a man called Macmillan in 1935. Um, my reprint is the last reprint, which was reprinted in 19, 1962, but it's basically a book written in 1935 by Macmillan, who was at the, that time the curator of the then Ceylon Botanic Gardens. Now, Sri Lanka, of course. Back then, Ceylon was a British colony and the British went out with their, their boats and they explored and they collected a lot of tropical plant stuff, in particular foods, but they collected everything. And the tropical stuff would go to Ceylon for Macmillan to grow. Some went to Kew Gardens, some went to Ceylon. The, the, the bounty was always split between the two for a number of years. So, in his book, in a, it's only like an, an eight pages in this massive work of his. Macmillan lists foliage pot plants um, for shady gardens or shady areas and other shady areas. These are, this is a total list, I believe, of the plants from the, uh, the Central and Southern American areas that were available at this, this time. So I'll go through them very quickly. But before I do, I've got, I just want to pose a question to you all that you can think about during my talk. Just think about how many species and cultivars of aroids you may have in your collection. 
Now, I know some of you young ones have probably got a database with every plant listed and the, and the date and where you collected it and all that, and you probably know that you've got 523 and a half plants. Uh, some of you might just have to take a guess, but think about that through my talk because we're going to have a show of hands at the end. It's not a bragging competition. Um, it's just a bit of fun, okay? So, anyway, moving on. These were the plants that were growing in the mid-1900s. Agonema costatum. Alocasia capria, gigantea, macariza, variegata was grown back then, and Alocasia sandroi. They also grew Anthurium, andreana, macrolobium, vichii, crystallinum, scherzerianum, and waracrianum, and these were all quite readily available. Now they're collector's items, aren't they? Collodiums, Certispermus, Diefenbachia braumannii was the Diefenbachia that was grown at the time. Dracontiums and pseudodracontiums were grown. Philodendrons. Andrianum, which we now know as Melanocrysum, Gloriosum, Erebescens, Mamii, Salum, and Scramiferum. And this plant, which was called Phyloteum lindenii, which then got reclassified into Zetosoma lindenii, and now it's Caladium lindenii. So that plant was also grown. Just a couple more to go. Pothos schizomatoglottis, schizocasia, um, which is near Portii, which is now, I believe, back in Alocasia, and Spathophyllum. In total, no more than 100 of the, the aroids were available for general purchase and cultivation at the time. And also, information on these plants, on how to grow them, was extremely limited. It wasn't just a mouse click to find out where a plant comes from and what you need to pot it in and how much sun it could take. There was a lot of guesswork and a lot of hearsay going on among these so-called collectors. Anyway, so back then, yeah, cultivation information was limited. It gets better as time goes on. My interest started in the 1970s. Um, I met a man called Len Butt, who was hybridising the large self-heading philodendrons, which we now call thormatophyllums. I become totally intrigued by this process whereby you've got to get up in the middle of the night, find a hot female flower, and um, then find um, a, a male, male flower that's uh, a male inflorescence, I should say, that's releasing pollen, and then have sex with your thormatophyllums. I thought, well, that's very exciting stuff if you know how to do it. Um, and I, I got to doing it myself. And then another thing happened that really got me seriously hooked on aroids. Uh, at the time, I was working for Hicks Brothers Nursery on the Gold Coast, and, and through the Palm and Psychad Society that I joined, I, I met a lady called Mrs Jennings uh, and her husband George, who had a small backyard nursery at Tweed Heads. You know, to this day, I don't know her first name. I always called her Mrs Jennings out of respect because I was uh, in my early 20s, and Mrs Jennings was about, about my mum's age at the time. And Mrs Jennings uh, and George were growing mainly ferns in, in their backyard. Now, the whole backyard, there was no grass. It was all shade houses and hot houses full of ferns. But in one corner hot house, where she took me one day, hidden down in the back corner, this was this plant called Philodendron andreanum that we now call Philodendron melanocrysum. And it had up, grown up the glass house wall to about the height of this, this ceiling and the leaves were over a metre long but at the mature end of the plant. And I just drooled over this thing, drooled over this thing. And every check time I went southern end of the coast on the delivery, I'd pop in and have another look at it. It took a year, a whole year. She took a cutting off it and gave it to me. I didn't ask, I just went there and worshipped the plant, you see. But by now I'm totally hooked, aren't I? Big self-heading philodendrons, exciting pollination process, and this awesome... Awesome philodendron uh, melanocrysum that I now had in my possession. Oh, by the way, she did pot it and strike the cutting before she gave it to me to, to make sure it would grow. Anyway, so then I was into it. And let me share about Anthurium andreanum, you know, the flowering types. They've been around in cultivation pretty much forever. But back in the 70s in South East Queensland, we could only get very limited colours. There was, there was red and a, and a tangerine orange type colour, but I'd never seen a white one in South East Queensland. Uh, my boss used to send me um, at least once a year to North Queensland to collect seed, mainly of, of palms, because that was what was selling big at the time, but I used to collect anything and everything that I was interested in. And I heard about this man called Herb Bosworth up near Innisfail and got his phone number, someone else referred me to him. I rang up Herb and um, he met me at his property where he had a half acre shade house with white anthuriums growing in a, a deep layer of bagasse and they had blooms on them like this. 
Well, if I was, a, if, if at this point in time, if I'd seen that for the first time, I probably would have wet myself. But these things were so big and beautiful, and he was cutting the flowers and sending them air freight to Sydney for the florist market. And I said, can I buy some plants for that? He said, yeah, dig your own, two bucks each. <laughs> That's true, two bucks each. And I was digging out these clumps of white anthurians and putting them in my truck. I've got about 40 of them. And um, he had hundreds of them. Uh, um, and they were too crowded anyway. Um, and I took them back and, uh, and potted them up at the nursery down the Gold Coast. And guess what? They didn't grow very well at all, did they? Because I didn't know what an anthurium mix was. I put them in the palm mix, didn't I? <laughs> Everything else grows in the palm mix. Why wouldn't these things? And they didn't grow very well at all. I had a learning experience there. And my boss probably ever had an even harder learning experience. <laughs> OK, so back then, new plants were hard to find, but the information was becoming readily available. In 1978, Roer's Greenhouses in America published that beautiful book called Tropica. And in Tropica, there are colour photos of at least a thousand different species and cultivars of aroids and there is a descriptive uh, section at the back of the book on each of those species and cultivars. So it tells you where they come from and, and a bit of basics about the plant that started to help me understand how to grow them. Um, and I think I would have not have been the only person in Australia who bought Tropica and sat there at night drooling over the photographs of these beautiful aroids and other tropical plants that we didn't yet have in Australia. Uh, so that sort of stimulated my enthusiasm to look for more. But over the years, the range of plants has increased remarkably, and I believe for three main reasons. Firstly, because of the, the daring people who have travelled overseas and collected seeds and, and live plant material and imported it into Australia so as they could share it with us here. And there's a few of those people here. Stan's brought lots of great stuff back from overseas. Um, as is Bruce Dunson, as you know, and of course Chris and Arden up in, in uh, um, at Red Lynch, they have brought amazing plants back, often at serious risk to themselves because of the places they've been. So that's one reason we have a much better range. The other reason is um, tissue culture. Yes. Now, it's very, it's very um, controversial, this tissue culture thing, but uh, a lot of people think it's a very new thing. In actual fact, the first um, uh, tissue culturing or in vitro growing of a plant in a laboratory was completed in 1934 by a man called Wright, a, a Swedish plant scientist. And by the 1950s, um, tissue culture was in full swing but not so much with aroids, but with, of course, orchids and a lot of food crops. I mean, pineapples, bananas, uh, obaki, uh, no, uh, uh, babacos, they were the first, first three to be tissue cultured, I believe. Um, I first got um, flasks of tissue culture philodendrons in the early 1980s. I think it was about 1983 I bought five flasks of five different hemiepiphytic climbing philodendrons and took them out of the flask and raised them. And I still have four of those plants to this day. Even though I've moved house four times since then, I've always kept the cuttings growing, grown, grown them veg vegetatively, and uh, they are very good plants, and they're still very good plants that people like to buy. And included in that was the Philodendron Burgundy Queen, uh, Philodendron Emerald Duke, uh, Pink Princess. I got the very first cloning of Pink Princess, and the other one was, uh, was another, oh, and red wings. I still grow red wings to this day because it's a very hardy indoor plant. And then there was another green one, which I don't have anymore. So I had good success with them, but not all tissue culture plants are successful, of course. Oh, the interesting thing I forgot to say was that very first growing of a plant in a laboratory in vitro, um, done, by the, but done by Wright, um, he used yeast extract to make the plant grow in the laboratory. Vegemite. <laughs> <laughs> vitamin Bs. We still to this day, with our tissue culture media, have to put vitamin B into what we usually use is what's called PDA, potato dextrose agar. So it's dextra potato dextrose, that's the sugar in potatoes. Agar is made from seaweed, but we have to add vitamin Bs or the plants won't grow. Okay, so tissue culture, you can have your own thoughts about that. Um, 
And the other reason we have so many really good new cultivars available now is because of fabulous hybridising uh, within Australia that people have been doing to create new cultivars. And there's, there's quite a lot of people who have been doing the, the hybridisation thing in recent years and creating some wonderful plants. Anyway, so moving on to the cultivation. That's enough history for the one day, isn't it? Okay, it's a very large family of plants, as you probably know. Over 100 genera, changing all the time, of course. More than 3,500 species, plus heaps of hybrids. Of those species, though, over 1,000 of them are anthuriums. There's more anthuriums than there are any other, any other um, genera, genus of um, aeroids. Philodendron comes, a close sec next, it comes second. They are found in almost all climates, regions and habitats on the planet, only the sea, the Arctic extremes and very high alpine regions are without aeroids. So they go right up to the Arctic Circle. They're found everywhere in deserts, they're found in swamps, they're found in rocky, rocky hillsides, just about every habitat on the planet. That makes generalisations really difficult, doesn't it? If I stand here and say, this is how you grow aeroids, and then use generalisation with such a diverse range of plants, that would be really quite silly. Having said that, though, most of the plants that we like to collect are pantropical, and they are therefore... Um, plants that are normally growing, gr normally grow in uh, a humid environment and a warm environment, occasionally a warm environment, but a uh, drier environment. So, having said that, that most of the plants we we tend to collect are the uh, the pantropical ones, it's appropriate to say that most aeroids have a definite liking for moisture and shelter. And as I always say, whether I'm talking about any particular group of plants, an understanding of the origin, biology and the ecology of a plant we wish to grow helps us make sensible decisions. And as our lecturer said to us when I was a student many years ago, find out the origin of your plant if you can. But I, he says, I don't mean does it come from Mexico. I mean whereabouts in Mexico. What ecosystem does it come from? Does it come from a rainforest where it grows as an epiphyte? Is it growing in a bog or a swamp? That's what he means by the origin of your plant, the ecosystem it, it comes from. So, having said that, I'm going to use just a few categories and examples of how we deal with this. Right, very popular are these scototropic hemiepiphytes, the climbers, which include, that word scototropic, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it means grows towards the dark. Because that's what these plants do in nature. Uh, the climbing uh, philodendrons, the climbing monsteras, the climbing anthuriums and all that, the, the, usually a, a bird eats the fruit or an animal eats the fruit. The seed is deposited on the, on the forest floor and it germinates and it grows to the dark because it wants to climb up a tree. And the darkest spot in the woodland or forest is the base of a tree, isn't it? So that plant could start here, the seed could germinate there, it could grow, grow along the ground as the ground cover as far as that post and then go up the, go up the tree. And these are the hemiepiphytes uh, and they're very, very popular. So obviously, where are you going to grow them? Not out in the sun in the middle of a lawn as a specimen, are you? Which I saw someone do down the Gold Coast one day. <laughs> I was driving home from work. I used to take a back road through Surface Paradise so where there was no traffic. And someone had dug a hole in a green front lawn and planted the climbing philodendron there. <laughs> I thought, that's going to love it there, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, so you need something for them to climb on for a start and they mainly need some shade and protection. There are some that will go out in a fair bit of sun, but uh, most of them do need some protection. And that's what they get from a tree, isn't it? A, sh a sh shady spot. And because they're scatotropic and, uh, and they're woodland or forest plants, it usually means that they grow naturally. The soil there, the there's a lot of compost, a lot of mulch in it. So as that seedling gets actually quite well fed until it gets well established on the tree, and then it will tend to work with what it gets coming down the trunk of the tree. Then we have another group of plants that uh, you'd all know about. These are the plants that have modified stems that form tubers or corms for storage. So um, alocasias and colocasias and uh, pseudodracontiums have tubers, which are modified stems um, which they can, they, can, they can store food and water in and they grow from these vegetative structures. Um, uh, caladiums, on the other hand, have corms, which are still... Um, uh, they are they're still modified stem material, just harder. The, the caladium corm is harder than the alocasia tuber, but they're both stem materials. So um, 
I'll talk about how you use that to advantage in propagation, but the thing about these, these plants that have these storage organs like corms and tubers, they are usually adapted to uh, a climate where there is a seasonal tough time. In other words, a seasonal dry, as we get in far north Queensland in the monsoonal areas, or a seasonal cold snap, a winter. And these plants die down to survive the season that is tough on them, whether it be a dry season or a cold season. Uh, and and that, is, that is quite relevant to how we grow them, isn't it? Because was it, is it wise to water a plant that's gone down and having a, uh, having a winter rest? A cladium can rot if the soil isn't well drained and we get incredibly heavy rain in winter, which we occasionally do out here. So that's why some people lift them, of course. In the, in the really wet zones, they lift them so they, the caladiums don't get too wet in winter. Okay, so these, they've got those with the generally have a defined dormancy period. There are a few allocages that tend to be evergreen, but a lot of them either thin out or die down completely in winter. And then there's another really interesting group of plants called the rheophytes. And a rheophyte is a plant that spends part or all of its life totally or, or partially submerged in water. So these are plants that grow along streams, rivers, sometimes even in high currents. Um, these are plants that are, uh, grow in um, floodplains where when a river, river bursts its banks in the wet season, the water comes over and these plants are submerged in water for a, a period of time. So uh, examples of rheophytes are Lassia spallinosa, uh, an Asian plant, um, and then we have Schismatoglottis, it's a genus of rheophytic plants. And these plants don't have tubers or corms, they have either rhizomes or stolons. So rhizomes are stems that grow under the ground and stolons are stems that grow on top of the ground. Um, and so these plants, we don't like to dry out because they're used to getting lots of water. In fact, these rheophytic plants are good ones to put in a damp spot in the garden if you have a damp spot and you want to soak the water up. Lassia spinosa, however, in a wet spot becomes a bit invasive because it's so aggressive with its rhizomes, it'll work its way through the soil and keep sending up these spiny leaves. But the reward, if you can put up the spines, is the most intriguing inflorescence that this plant gets. Okay, so we nearly usually try to keep the rheophytes wet. In fact, the rheophytes in pots often struggle. I will, that's, they're the ones I will sit in a dish of water so they can keep taking some water up, maintain the humidity. So, moving on to cultivation in the garden of these plants. I've, I don't think I've ever met a, a family of plants that respond to soil improvement the way these guys do. They are amazing how they like to have their soil improved. They like really good drainage, but they like good moisture retention. They like high levels of organic material, and they like high levels of sustained nutrition. Those of you who have been in there and had a look at my garden along that wall, it's seven months old. That garden is only seven months old, and before it was planted, I added my own compost that I make to the existing soil. I built it up with, with compost. Then I added, oh, I forget how many blocks I put in there, 60-40 coir, uh, coarse perlite, and then I add organic extra uh, fertilizer pellets, and I also use microbial rock minerals, and I put them into the soil, dig it all through, and then I planted it. And, and the, the plants haven't looked back, basically. It's, uh, the best thing you can do uh, for aroids is, is give them a good start with really good soil, and, and they will respond appropriately. I pretend, prefer to use organic sources of nutrients in the garden and I do use the controlled release products in containers and that's what I'll talk about now. In containers, I've found that one, one potting media does not grow all the plants as well as I like them to. I had a thing here and if somebody would have heard, in other clubs or organisations would have heard me, heard me say, like, I've got my media simplified, I've got one general media and I'm using that for aroids and begonias and da-da-da and da-da-da-da-da-da. Well, I've changed that in the last 12 months because, um, because I've been raising quite a lot of um, plants from seed, I've found that the seedlings don't do well in my regular general potting media. So I've gone to a media that's got a lot more, uh, a lot better drainage, more perlite in it uh, and better drainage. And I've also added some small charcoal. Um, you know, I had two containers, where are they? Ah, under Kevin's feet, yeah.
So these are the two media I'm using. I'll, I'll put them up here and you can come and have a closer look later. But uh, this, is, this is my small pot media, which is 60-40 coir perlite, 60-40 uh, uh, coir, coarse perlite, um, and the small charcoal. It drains very freely because I've got quite a lot of perlite in there um, with, with, with the coir. This mixture here has got compost, the same, same thing, uh, a bit less perlite, but it's also got the coir plus um, added composted bark fines. This is a much denser media and it holds a lot more moisture, so it's really good for bigger, fast growing plants, especially like philodendrons and thormatophyllums that can tend to dry out fairly quickly once they fill the pot. So this media holds a lot more water and it works quite well. So they've got tags in them anyway, so that's the small pot media. They look very similar, but they are actually quite different in the way they behave. Okay, so um, yeah, I've told you what I put in it. Um, the main thing with potting media, it doesn't matter whether it's arrows or any other plant, consistency. Don't keep changing it, you know. Uh, try and simplify your media, not too many major ingredients. Like this, this product's only got two major ingredients, this has got three. Um, not too many ingredients, that you only get strange interactions, chemical reactions going on with too many ingredients. Um, so keep it simple, and consistency is the key. Um, don't, uh, make sure you get it pretty, if you've got a mix that works, Keep making it the same, otherwise your watering can tend to go haywire. Uh, if you've got plants in, in different growing media, um, you, you, you can have problems with your watering. Um, but look, having said that, like you, I buy plants that shows at markets and from nurseries, and I bring them home, and I, of course, one of the things I do is look at what they're growing. If it's a really great looking plant, I'll check out what the growers used in the, in the pot. But then I've tipped some of them out, and they're growing in absolute muck. Rubbish. I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want to, you couldn't, you couldn't grow weeds in some of the stuff that I've found that people get plants to grow into. So, um, arrowheads are a lot tougher than some people think, and a lot of them are really hard, hard plants and easy to grow. You know, like I remember seeing these self-healing philodendrons outside a service station up in Air, North Queensland, years ago, where the little plant must have been planted in the hole in the concrete like that. And there you have a plant where the, the trunk has completely filled the hole in the concrete and the thing's as lush and happy as anything. It's got aerial roots all over the top of the concrete. It's still growing beautifully. Um, some, of the, some of you members here from Palm Society days may remember a guy called John Bulger who used to live in the Crumbin Valley. I went to John Bulger's place one day and he, he, had, a, he had a hut on the hill there and there was a, a really steep um, sort of rocky um, slope down to a pond at the bottom of the hill. And... Uh, and it was virtually no topsoil, it was just rocky, stony rubbish. He had planted a self-heating philodendron, like a philodendron saloon, up on this slope. I looked at it and I said, John, that's not going to grow there, that's dry and hard. When I went back six months later, what this thing had managed to do over time is grow one root all the way down the hill until it got into that pond and then it went <laughs> like that. The first root was followed by a second, third, fourth and fifth until you had a whole matter of roots going down the hill and this thing was growing like crazy. So I don't have to say to John, I take it back. You're a better gardener than I thought you were. <laughs> anyway, what do we move on to now? Propagation. All right? The interesting thing about, as far as I know, all aroids, in nature they've got more than one way they can propagate themselves. So they... Um, they're pretty much all capable of produce, have the potential to produce seeds. Although, of course, a lot of them won't produce us seeds in Australia unless we give them some help in the form of hand pollination because the insects that do the job in other places are not in Australia. But they do all have the potential to set seed and be grown from seed. Um, and all of them have some other vegetative, a vegetative structure they can grow from. The hemiepiphytic climbers, a bit can be broken off, boom, fall down on the ground and grow again. As you know, alocasias, they produce uh, extra tubers and you can separate them and, and propagate them that way. Um, uh, caladiums, actually you can divide a caladium, core them up, chop it up into bits. And they're in their, in their natural habit. There's animals that actually dig up caladiums and, and eat them, of course, but they don't eat the whole lot, like what birds when they come to your strawberry patch. They just take a chunk out of each strawberry, don't they? They eat the whole one. No, that, that, that'd be. 
So, yeah, there are things like that happen in nature which allow the plant to propagate itself. And there's even, uh, one comes to mind, it's got three ways it can naturally reproduce itself. And you don't know this plant, a Morphophallus bulbifera. It comes from North Queensland. It can be weedy because it produces seed that germinate really, really, really freely without any assistance. It has a corm under the ground which if broken will grow more than one plant, or if damaged will send up multiple shoots. And it also produces these little round structures at the, at the top of the leaf, in the fork of the leaf, called bulbils. And bulbils are not modified stems, they're modified leaves. So that bulbil is a modified leaf, just like an onion is a modified leaf. And it can grow as well. So there's one plant there, it's got three methods that, hence survivability is increased, isn't it? The more methods a plant has by which it can reproduce itself, the greater the survivability, especially in harsh conditions. Okay, so seeds, yeah, well, for most of them, cleaning is essential. Uh, most aroid fruits contain a water-soluble chemical inhibitor that stops the seed from germinating. So if you were to just put the fruit with the seed inside it on a tray, it'll, it will eventually grow once the fruit rots away or the ants eat it, if the seed survives. So the essential thing is to separate the, the pulp of the fruit from the seed and if you're able to, wash it. So I will put my, uh, get my seeds out of the pulp and put them in a fine sieve, like a flour sieve, and under the tap and give them a good wash because that inhibitor that stops or slows the seeds down is water soluble which is good because in other families we find fruits that have um, inhibitors around the seed coat which are not water soluble and these are plants with the digestive tract of a bird or an animal is essential before the seed can easily germinate so um, fortunately with aroids it's water soluble inhibitors as far as I know and we can get rid of them with washing um, so Moving on from there, so cleaning, yeah, media for, media for seeds. Most people prefer sphagnum moss um, these days for raising seed. Uh, Alan and I have been talking about this. I find the regular stuff you buy too far too coarse. The seed germinates well. But then when you come to trying to separate the things, they're all tangled up with the, in the sphagnum moss. So, um, and I, when I was talking to Alan about it, he does the same thing as me. Sits down with a pair of scissors and chops his sphagnum moss up really small. And Pat's nodding her head, she does it too. I do that, chop the sphagnum up small and then it makes it easier to separate the, the seedlings later once they come up. Okay, so yeah, our oh, temperature. Um, most aroid seeds from the pan-tropical regions, so we're talking Central and South America, the stuff we like, anthurians and philodendrons, etc., won't germinate below 25 degrees C. Um, I can germinate anthurium philodendron seed quite happily in the shade house during summer but uh, not in winter because it gets too cold. And bear in mind it's night temperatures that are critical, not day temperatures. Uh, so philodendrons actually germinate best at 30 degrees plus, but anthuriums like 25 degrees and they germinate very readily on 20, at 25 degrees. Um, you probably, if you've been into my hothouse, you'd notice I have a heat mat there and the thermostat is set to 25 degrees through winter so I can germinate seeds. The main thing to watch out for with raising seed is damping off fungi, of course. That's, the, that's probably about the worst thing that can happen. Uh, and, and a fungus can take over, over a whole tray of seedlings in no time whatsoever. You've basically got two alternative approaches there uh, as to how to deal with it if you have a problem. You can go the chemical way, which means using a fungicide, um, or as uh, referred to Alan again, use the uh, Milton solution, which is a, a chlorinated... Um, product which will stop fungi and bacteria. So you either do that, which is the chemical approach, or you go to the natural approach, which I prefer to use, and I use a product called Companion that some of you have heard me talk about, which contains a bacteria called Bactitis, bac uh, it's Bacillus uh, subtilis, which is a very powerful natural antifungal um, orga organism. It's very, it's um, the list of fungal organisms that um, this Bacteria controls is an A4 page long and it does control all your damping off organisms and pythium and, and, and a whole lot of um, fungus problems in all sorts of plants and it works on foliage and root systems to protect both. So it's a very, very, that's the product I prefer to use. 
Okay, moving on to cuttings. You can grow a lot of them from tip cuttings, from stem cuttings, and some even from leaf cuttings. My personal experience in my place, in my climate, don't propagate them in, in winter. It's just a waste of time. I've got some plants in there that aren't growing very well because I finished, finished that hot house in the last week of autumn. I thought, I've got a hot house now, I can put some cuttings in here. Even though it's a hot house, no. Too late in the year. Um, best to do all your propagation from October through to about the end of March, I believe. That's what I try to do. Because Stan rang me the other day, he said, you propagating yet? No, it's not warm enough at night. It's night temperatures, see? But by October, the night temperatures are up there and, and things will strike really quickly. If I put cuttings in now, they won't be as big come Christmas times as the plants I'll put next, down next month. Because they grow, f you need to get the sap flowing in the mother plant before you cut her. And at the end of winter, the sap's just starting to, to get active again. Once you've had a few weeks of hot weather, the sap's flowing well and the cuttings will strike well. And bear in mind with a lot of aroids, they've all got calcium oxalate in their sap, which is a, is a serious irritant. Um, Thief and Barkies, of course, got the highest level of it, and that's why they're called dumb canes. If you get them in the mouth, you become speechless. I was like, oh, put one of them in your salad, Mum. Yeah, <laughs> if you can put it in mine, I can find a way to put it in yours, boy. Yeah. Oh, you'd, you'd, you'd put it in my wine. I know what you'd do. Anyway, so moving on, moving on from there. Um, Yes, yeah, so be careful of the sap. Um, it, can, it can irritate, and, and the dark leaf stuff, like the, the darker leaf philodendrons, they will actually stain your hands too. They'll turn your hairs black, because that, that sap is, is it's the same color, yeah, it'll make you itchy. So, you know, wear gloves if, you, if you've got sensitive skin, for sure. And the other thing with doing the cuttings of these resinous, sappy things, is you've got to let them dry to get the best results. Um, some of them I will cut today, plant tomorrow. But certainly cut in the morning, let them dry for a few hours and plant them in the afternoon. If you plant um, resinous cuttings of philodendrons uh, that are weeping, when you put them in, the, the, the wound doesn't callus, it doesn't heal, and the cutting will bleed out because of the water in the potting media. So that's why you need to let them dry until they've sealed themselves on the end, and then they don't usually look back. Leaf cuttings, the one that comes to mind there is Zamia colchis zamifolia. You probably all know that, the zamia. It uh, grows quite readily from leaf cuttings. It's actually a desert plant. And then we've got those with the modified stems. I've talked about that, tubers, rhizomes, stolons, and corms. Well, they can all be, they can all be um, divided up um, and usually done at the end of winter because before they burst into their new growth. So if you've got an alocasia that's got pups around it, babies around it, little... Uh, we call them tubercles, the little miniature tubers around it. Uh, pluck them off at the end of winter before they start to shoot and then they'll, as soon as the warm weather comes through they'll start to grow quite well. And some plants do a combination. Uh, um, Alocasia longoloba is an interesting thing because um, on its main stem or main tuber it'll put out a little short right, a stolon which is uh, a stem that grows in the air uh, horizontally out there and then it'll grow a a little tuber on the end of that, and I'm sure you, some of you have seen that, and that's called a tubercle, and you can take them off and grow them, although I find the success rate with those little tubercles is, is not high for me. I don't get them all to grow. And then I've talked about some plants that have modified leaves, bulbils, and uh, yeah, they, um, they are quite easy to grow too. And uh, yeah, at the end I just say timing is everything. And I've come to my last page of notes. So it must be question and answer time. Dumbfounded. <laughs> a favourite? Yeah, yeah um, Semillon uh, Savion Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said, do I have a favourite aeroid? Favourite No. I like so many of them. When you cut the stems too, and they're bleeding, you could trim it in to... Absolutely no. That's a no-no. You've got to, people, too many, people believe that when you've got a wound you should put some sort of a dressing on it. Like Kevin just asked the question, do I put you know, fungicidal dust on the cut surface or tomato dust or anything like that. People, a lot of people think that when you cut a branch of a tree you've got to put some stuff on it, don't you? 
it's, it's, old, it's old technology. It doesn't work. It's detrimental to the health of the plant. The healing of a damaged plant requires on the presence of oxygen. As soon as you cut a branch of a tree and you put some grafting mastic on it, oxygen can't get to the wound so it can't heal properly. All right. When you cut a philodendron, if you put some powder or anything on the end, it can't get oxygen to it so it doesn't callus properly. There's a process that actually happens caused by oxygen. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I won't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I've changed house five times, but I've t taken the plant with me every time, or cutting off the mother plant. And it's that the original mother plant is down in my back shade house, right down the back near the back fence. You'll see it growing up a wall there. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you for listening.